Hi everybody, it's great to be all together once again, albeit on a screen. And thank you for joining us in, well, for joining me in this conversation. It is not the first conversation we've had, and I, I don't think it's the last either. Um, we have a lot to talk about in terms of black empowerment, black history, black experiences, and, and you know, and, and the presence of black people in, in our careers, in our studies, in the things that we're doing every day. So what we're talking about today, very specifically the conversation is around black visibility in the sciences and inspiring the next generation. So before we start our conversation, how about we all introduce ourselves? Um, so start with you, Olivia. Yeah, okay. Um, hi, my name is Olivia Mahaley. I am 20 years old and I am a second year on the Bachelor of Veterinary Medicine uh, five-year degree program at RVC. And I'm also a student ambassador and representing animal aspirations in this discussion. Fantastic. And we want to hear more about animal aspirations because there's a lot to talk about when it comes <laughs> to animal aspirations. Okay, Ellie, how about you next? Hi, uh, my name's Ellie Bain and I am a fourth year Bachelor of Veterinary Medicine student, also on the five year degree like Olivia. And I'm here representing the Students' Union as your Vice President Welfare. Um, yeah, really excited to be here. Fabulous. Thanks, Ellie. Winnie? Hi, I'm Winnie. I'm a final year PhD student in microbiology at the Royal Veterinary College, and I'm also on the LIDO programme. Fantastic. And Donald. Hi, my name is Dr. Donald Palmer. Uh, I'm an associate professor of immunology here at the Royal Veterinary College. Uh, I don't know if I'll give my age, <laughs> but, 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 but uh, you, you are too young. Uh, but I've been at the RVC, oh, this is embarrassing, uh, since 2002. Fantastic. So, yeah. So we've got the whole spectrum then. We've got our undergraduate students, our PhD students. We've got Donald, who's been here for a number of years. We won't say <laughs> how many. And, and, and so really, I think we've got a really good representation of, of experiences and, and views and, and perspectives um, across the board. And I'll introduce myself. I forgot about myself. I'm Christine Thuranira Makiva, and I'm the um, chair of the Equality and Diversity Committee, and I'm also the director for distance learning um, at the RBC. Okay, so to start off, you know, it's, it's, it's a well-known fact that black people are really underrepresented, underrepresented in the sciences in, in this country. And I just wonder, what was it that, that inspired you, or who was it that inspired you to get into the sciences? That's a question for everybody. You know, how did you start out? What made you get into the sciences? Should I start then? Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I, at school, I liked lots of subjects. I found it quite difficult to like pin myself down to like decide what I wanted to do in the future. Um, and I remember I was watching a Netflix documentary about a um, Virunga National Park. So in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is where my dad's from. So I was like, oh, this is so cool. This is about like, you know, the country that my dad's from. And it was talking about how these rangers have such a hard challenge you know, keeping, you know, the national park safe from, uh, you know, all these outside external factors. And there was this one scene where um, they have a lot of, they have one of the large populations of mountain gorillas. So there was a scene where the orphans of the mountain gorillas who had been orphaned by poaching and stuff like that um, were at the, their orphanage facility. And then there were rebel groups that were kind of trying to take over the national park. And these orphan gorillas were just so like terrified and scared. And one of the comments they said is that, oh, we couldn't get a vet in to like help them or like help treat them or help save them. So one of them died. And I was like, I never want there to be a situation where no, like someone can't come in and help. And I was like, I have to do something, not directly about this, but I was like, if something can be done, why can't I be the person to do it? So I was like, I'm going to set myself up on this journey. And yeah, now I'm at I'm the second year at Med, Med, Med at RVC. So that was, I wouldn't say like the only factor that helped me get into sciences, but that was one of the like pivotal moments where I was like, I need to pursue something in science and I'm going to do this because I think this is what I, this is what I need to do. So, yeah. Fantastic. What about you, Winnie? 
Um, I think it was purely uh, accidental. Um, it wasn't anything that I actively pursued uh, with any intention of a final career. Um, so I just followed my interest um, from school, which was the sciences and arts. Mm -hmm. And then, um, because I, I never really saw, I guess, classic examples. Whenever you see um, scientific figures that are contributing to science, they're always white or they're definitely not black. That's not the norm. Yeah. Um, so I never thought I could pursue it, let alone contribute it in, to it in any way. Um, so everything was just purely accidental. So I just, I like biology and I really like chemistry. So I did biological sciences as my undergrad degree. And it wasn't until uh, final year when one of my lecturers was talking about placements and PhDs and things like that. Because before I just assumed that how PhDs work is that a lecturer will see a student and go, you, you're smart, sign up for this. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's how I thought it worked. I didn't realize there was a formal application process or that there are things that you can do to help, uh, I guess, the, the process become easier for you to then, you know, end up in that um, space. Yeah. So this was purely um, accidental. So I guess that's why throughout my PhD and also in my master's, I've tried to do um, outreach events where I try to have more visibility of what scientists could look like or can look like and yeah. what they are. Yeah. Gosh. Oh, sorry. Um, Donald. So, um, you, you know, Olivia said something really interesting because she says that, you know, there's pivotal moments, but there are a lot of things along the way sure. that, you know, can inspire you. And I was just reflecting on that. And that and that's true. Um, you know, for, for me, um, so uh, as a as a teenager, about yeah, 12, 12, 13, I was I ended up doing paper round. So, um, yeah. You know, if you remember, papers were papers and you had to deliver them, right? Now we have the internet. So I, I, I got incredibly bored. So so something my, my dad, so my, my, my parents, but particularly my dad, was very old fashioned. You know, he's insisting that, you know, you've got to get a job. So uh, at the age of 12, did a paper around, but I got bored carrying newspapers up and down. So I used to read Marvel comics. And oh, I remember those. I remember yeah, those. yeah. And, and one of the guys that was really amazing was was Spider-Man, well, in particular, Peter Parker. So Peter Parker, oh, yeah. yeah, you know, he was, he was into science. So I thought that was really cool. So, so that, that was partly, um, you know, one, one of the inspirations, you know, he wore glasses, I wore glasses. And, um, but one of the, the, but the, the interest for me w was really fueled by, by um, my parents, who I'm completely in debt to. So, you, you, you know, my, my parents are from, you know, the Caribbean, they're the part of the Windrush generation, late 50s. There's six of us in the family. We're in a literally a very small house, you know, classically from from that generation. My mum was a was a, a, a cleaner uh, uh, and my dad worked on the buses. So money is tight. Um, but I, I kind of like science and I wanted a chemistry set. So I saw every day I used to walk to school. Um, I saw the co-op and they had this chemistry set outside in the window. And I said, wow, I'd love to get one of those. Um, you know, I spoke to my parents about it and they went, no, nah, we really can't afford it, which is understandable. But they did. They bought me a chemistry set for Christmas. And that was really the turning point. Um, you know, actually looking back at that chemistry set, I'm sure most of it broke health and safety rules now. So so, so they, they, it came with like related spirit. Uh, it came with, oh, I know, Olivia, it was amazing. It, it was literally, and it came with so many chemicals. I mean, yeah, I almost burnt the house down. <laughs> I turned the bathroom green, which didn't go down well with the family. No, so all sorts, but it was, it, that, that, you know, for, for me was, um, you know, one of the major catalysts. And the final point, and this is where schools come in, uh, and this is where I think Winnie's right in terms of visibility. And, and, you know, I'm really in debt to my chemistry teacher, Mr. Irving. So I went to an all boys school, pretty rough, South London back then. Um, but the, the only thing I, 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 again, with the interest that I got from chemistry, I got a prize. I got a prize for chemistry. I got a book prize. In fact, I still have the book to this day. Wow. Um, and that that was, you know, um, some of the, the, the key points. There are others which I'm more than happy to discuss later on. Um, but for now, you know, th those were the kind of key factors. So I just wonder 
how the visibility of people of, of role models or people like yourselves had anything to do with your decision to get into the sciences or was it by sheer luck or you know um, for me determination i i was i was really lucky and I, I didn't really realise until I came to university that how lucky I was having such a strong role model in my family. My dad, you know, from a young age, you know, your story, Donald, reminds me so much of my dad's story. He just wanted a chemistry set when he was younger and he wanted to help people. And so he he worked really hard to get into university and he was a doctor. And so my first memories of like sitting on his lap and like looking at all of these different surgery photos and he's like well you know you can fix this if you move the tissue like this and I was so young at the time and having his support throughout my childhood was really important in becoming a vet and I think she just really taught me that the most important thing in medicine is just about learning to help people and he I love the stories about all the different patients that he got to treat but I told myself you know I don't really want to do people I want to do animals which is why I got into veterinary medicine and having role models throughout my childhood in my teachers and in my mum and in my dad I'm indebted to them and I was just wondering for you guys were there any particularly Winnie and Olivia were there any role models or teachers in school or other students that really helped men you and help you get to where you are now that you credit and are thankful for yeah when I whenever I look back um, I, I think there are set, um, different key figures at different um, stages throughout my life so um, when I was in secondary school a levels my chemistry teacher Dr Kizik she was very aggressive <laughs> in her teaching style she um she will just call your name out and she will ask you the question directly and you had no room to escape and she was very um fair with how she taught us and it never felt like I couldn't do anything if anything she pushed me harder in chemistry mm. than any of my other teachers ever did and then I got to undergrad and it was the same with one of my lecturers uh Dr Tassos I think he actually gave a talk here last year um, and he was very, um, he, he, just, he would just say, apply for this placement or have you thought about applying for this, um, this project or have you thought about, it was never anything to do with, I never felt like an outsider because of race. Um, I only felt like an outsider in, in terms of race during lectures, but not when it came to just pure science, if that makes sense. Um, so whenever I was one-to-one um, -one with lecturers or one-to-one -one, um, with, I guess, my friends, I always felt included in science. Um, so whether we have lab projects that we work together, I felt included. But it's when you are sitting in a lecture hall and you look around and you realise, oh, well, I'm actually one of three or one of four, then it, then it starts to feel, um, you start to feel excluded because, I mean, science is a community. Right. So and if you don't feel like you're a part of that community fully integrated, you do start to think, well, where does this go for me in terms of um, future progression or career? Is this even worth pursuing if I'm going to feel like this throughout um, the rest of the time? So when it comes to because, I mean, science, as it as it as it, as it is, as a concept, it's not um, it's not going to spark, I guess, strong or negative emotions in you because it's a neutral thing, right? Science is science, but it's more people that facilitate science. And therefore, if you have a bad experience with someone in science, then you're going to associate that with science and then walk mm -hmm. away. So, which is again, why I tried to have as, ma as many, as many um, different examples of what science could be um, whenever I'm outside doing anything related to outreach. Yeah. I don't even understand because I went to a school that was very like multicultural, very encouraging. Mm -hmm. So I never really felt like out of place until I came to the RVC and I was looking around and I was like, I really am like in a minority here. And my school was a good school, but they didn't have like the facilities of like how to help me get into veterinary medicine. So I had to do that all of myself. I had to research everything myself. I had to you know I, the interview process application like all of that I had to find out on myself you know finding work experience which is such a huge part of like actually like making it through the application process mm -hmm. I had to like email and ask all these people and every placement that I like work experience I went to 
all the vets and nurses and just like all the staff at all the practices were so lovely and they wanted to like help encourage or they wanted to tell you their knowledge and they wanted to share that so I think having that supportive like role like they were just you know doing the job that I thought oh I want to do that and they were like yes you can do that and they were quizzing me and they were testing me and they knew that I hadn't like been at vet school because I was like a level you know before vet school when you were applying but they were like oh no but what do you think about this like how does this work and they were challenging me and I was like yes like this is definitely something I want to do like they helped me realize I was like I can do this but then when I did get to uni uh, and I'm looking around and I'm like there's just not there's just not that many people here that's when I started to feel like discouraged like there was nothing up until that point that made me feel like I couldn't go into science until I was actually like at university level mm. and then I was like oh like why what what what's going wrong here why isn't there more people like me or like my friends like from like secondary school at like, at this prestigious level that's what yeah that was a bit strange yeah, yeah. I, I, I wanted to make some comments because because what's really interesting and this is really to hear, uh, you know, Olivia and Winnie, what you describe as, as part of your educational journey is is both encouraging um, to say progress has been made because, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of the 60s. Yeah. And, 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 and <laughs> you, you laugh. Uh, I know you say, no, no, he can't be that holy. He, he, he can't be that holy. He's just, yeah. he's just, We're not he's believing just... you, darling. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know what they say? Well, I know my, my daughters always say black don't crack. But anyway. <laughs> But, but here's the difference, uh, and where I do see some improvement. If you look at my story, so, so um, and you may not be aware. So back then in the 60s and 70s, um, a number of black children um, were classified as educational subnormal. So this is, uh, you know, and, and in fact, back then in the 70s, and you, you may or may not be aware, but, but um, in terms of, you guys do what's called GCSEs now, mm. right? But prior to GCSEs, there were O-levels. But there were two categories of, 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 of pre-16 education. There was O-levels and CSEs, Certificate of Secondary Education, right? Now, O-levels, um, you get A, B or C, you can get, go on to do, um, you know, uh, A-levels. CSCs are very much classified as like foundation GCSEs to a certain degree. Um, but CSEs used to be called the poor man's O-level because uh, if you get a grade one in CSE, that's only equivalent to an O-level C, right? So it, 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 at, at my time at school, a number of black kids were literally just thrown. I mean, there were some guys that were brighter than me. Um, that were actually just thrown into CSEs. So a whole wave of people were just in what was called CSEs. And, and that, I think, has had a massive and lasting legacy and impact. And, and what that led to, for example, was the setup of what's called black supplementary schools. Because parents realised, hold on a moment, our children aren't getting the, the, the right education. So that, that was... So there was two things. There was a wave of supplementary educational schools formed, but then there was also campaigns, um, you know, and deliberations around how um, education can be better for black children. And so part of that fight and struggle, which I'm hearing has been successful, partly, there's still problems, mind you, is your story, Olivia and Winnie, when you were encouraged. Back then, mm. yeah, we weren't encouraged at all. And there is still evidence within, you know, schools of low expectations for black pupils. Um, but so so part of my journey uh, and 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 when Christine, you know, you comment on inspirational role models was really pertinent for me. So I ended up doing CSCs at schools and was considered now nah, you're not going to get anywhere. And for me, one of the sparks was had got the interest you know from my parents in, in chemistry but I was as a as a kid I watched Muhammad Ali on TV and again the TV now is very different to when it was very few black people are on TV very few I mean I've been watching some of the stories on Black History Month um, and it's so different and Muhammad Ali was one of the first person I saw on TV a black man who was incredibly proud of who and what he and what he is and um, you may or may not know his career, um, but 
I remember an interview he did with Michael Parkinson. You can watch it on YouTube. Oh, I and remember was, that interview. It, and it was astounding. And it was, yes. for me, it was like, wow, he was articulate. And I don't mean to be derogatory by that. But but you have to remember, um, the, the, the only image you had of black people or what was referred to was pure negative. And so seeing this guy, and more importantly, his belief for what he stood for, um, where he decided, um, you know, he was banned from boxing because of his belief. Primarily, he didn't want to fight for wars. He was proved right in the end. But the fact that he was prepared to do that and the, the discussion he had with Michael Parkinson's are, are revered. And when I saw those, I was like, wow. I think Michael Parkinson interviewed him three or four times. Mm. And, and that, that, for me, was was just you know seeing someone like that that was the real trigger in that in that in that determination and being able to you know overcome and try to achieve and that i think was amazing wow you and love you no sorry i was gonna say olivia you do a lot of work with in animal aspirations of trying to keep that momentum going where over the last 10 years we've seen a really like big uptick in the number of BAME students entering higher education institutions. And there is a higher dropout rate, which is another issue within itself. But to get people here, to bring them into this really exciting institution, like especially at RVC, your group are doing a lot of work. And I want to know. What's <laughs> Tell us a secret, go on. Yeah, so Animal Aspirations is a student-led organisation founded by two lovely girls, Steph and Lavinia. Um, it was only founded in January 2019, so we're still pretty, pretty new in like the grand scheme of things. And what we mainly aim to do is just to encourage secondary school and with a focus on primary school children into going into STEM. Like it doesn't have to be obviously this is Royal Veterinary College has got a veterinary you know like bias towards it and a science like animal science bias but we it's more about getting people interested in the sciences like full stop so we put on like workshops interactive workshops where the kids can engage with like clinical scenarios or with like specific cases which they really enjoy and it's really cute seeing them being so like eager and to want to participate in things like that or you know sometimes we can like bring someone will bring in a dog to like the workshops and it's like some of them don't have pets so for them to be able to interact with animals and stuff like that is really nice um and then obviously because of covid we can't be doing some of that anymore but we have been doing um like talks and we do put on and we on our website we have a lot of blog posts where each of the team members write about stuff i recently wrote one about um one health it was called can vets prevent the next pandemic and it was all about like how vets are a part of like a larger global society of like scientists and like what you because i feel like the majority of people when you say vets think of small mm. like practice but it's mm. like how many other things you can do like with a vet degree like you can become a part of the government you can work with like epidemiologists and stuff like that just like breaking the stereotypes of what people think scientists are or like what vets are or just what people in STEM can look like. So again, all of this like black mm. visibility. Um, I really like, the reason I wanted to join Animal Aspirations is because again, there just wasn't that many people in my year and I, who were from a minority background. And I said, this, I just know that there is talent out there. We just need to make sure that they know that this is an option for them. So, and <clears throat> The whole team is lovely like everyone who's a part of the team you can genuinely tell that they have like a passion for wanting to help implement change and when you see them doing the workshops for the talks like they're ge that's just so inspiring I think that everyone who is a part of the team is a role model because even if we're only there for like one day or one afternoon you never know how much like that is going to impact on someone's life because it doesn't necessarily have to be like a mentorship role but just being there and being present and like giving you know your attention to someone and helping like spark that fire of interest in STEM I just think I just oh, I'm just so proud I'm proud of everything that they've done and I feel really <laughs> blessed and grateful to be a part of the organization. Do you, do yeah. you feel like a role model Winnie? Penelope what was that sorry? Do you feel like a role model? Oh <laughs> um I don't know. I don't feel like a role model, but I. But that doesn't stop me from, I guess, doing things that might be classed as role model-like. I think that's more important than the label. Um, 
I think as long as my main thing is to make science seem less scary and more appealing and um, just to, if, if someone has an interest in it, encouraging them to cultivate that interest and that's all I can do. And then I just walk away from that. Um, <laughs> anything else that comes with that, I'm I sort of shy away from. <laughs> well, Winnie, you do actually do quite a bit of active supporting, if you like, and mentoring. You might not realise it as such, but you, you, you help younger students in labs and then you yeah. go and talk to, you know, to, to students and, and I guess present yourself as as what they could be you know a phd yeah. student yeah. yeah so so you do actively get involved in that don't you yes um, yes i do that that is a, a massive part of what i i just i just want to make it seem less daunting and less scary because um i don't think it's as scary as people make out i think a lot of it is just the fear of what their career looks like. I mean, whenever you see scientists in movies or on TV, it's it's always this hyper intellectual sort of daunting um, figure where it's like, oh, you you can't have a conversation with them; they're too smart. Or it's, that, it's always that sort of um, distant um, appeal. I I just want to bring it a bit closer and a bit more realistic. That you know, the average scientist is very very different to what you actually think they would be and actually there isn't one personality type or one character trait to what a scientist looks like and mm -hmm. you know some of my friends they like to crochet <laughs> and some of them rock climb and some of them you know are into MMA <laughs> but they're all scientists <laughs> you know so it's like it doesn't matter um, what you look like as long as you have that interest you should pursue it. No, I mean, what, what you guys, you know, living with you, what you've mentioned is, is key. And, and I've just taken a, a few notes. And, and in a sense, it's highlighted, you know, talent is everywhere, opportunity is not. And it seems that's why, you know, it, it, and, and this is this key thing. And you kind of walk into that is, is what you can see is what you can be. And that's really, I mean, I mean, in the end, what we're talking about is advertising. Because then advertising, we know works. If it didn't work, um, it wouldn't be a million pound industry. You know, you see someone driving a car and you think, wow, that could be me. So so um, th th this is it. And it, it is those images are, are really important. And in, in essence, that that's part of what black history is about. It is really about highlighting the contribution black people have made to, to Britain. To the point where hopefully in the future there won't be a black history month because british history and black history is will be intertwined um and but but yeah the, the power of um you know of visibility is, is such i remember i was involved in one project funnily enough um was with the royal society so the royal society you know premier in, in terms of science uh, 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 in the UK, um, recognised there was one, there's two, one, there was a lack of uh, inclusive and diversity in science, mm. but they also recognised that um, black students, BAME students in general, are going to university, which is great, but, you know, not, but very few were going into sciences. So there's a talent stream now yeah. that's out there. So th they came up with this project uh, a couple of years ago called Inspiring Scientists. And they um, interviewed 10 um, scientists from BAME background. Um, they grabbed me. <laughs> so there was me. Um, there's Maggie Delka Pocock, who does Sky at Night, um, who's an amazing uh, scientist, uh, and a number of other scientists from diverse backgrounds. Um, they filmed our story, so so they came to the RBC and filmed me in the lab. Um, and um, and what they then what they did, what they then did was um, made YouTube clips, posted them all out on, on social media, and then they made um, school packs of each of the ten scientists and um, sent them out to schools. That's interesting because as an ambassador, me and a few friends often have conversations feeling quite disheartened about how like, um, you know, BAME students are posted all over the RVC social media, they're mm. you know, present for every event, but it's like a true reflection of what mm. the demographic of the cohorts are. So sometimes we're just like, one of my friends I was speaking to and he was getting really like dis 
disheartened. He was like, I feel like I'm just being used as, you know, you know, just to be like the token person. And I was like, but by showing you on these posters, it's showing that other people can also do that. So yes. I definitely think, Donald, that's such an important part of like visibility and how that actually can implement change. Uh, and as I said, I've been at the college since 2002, and I can tell you that the, the student body is changing. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know it's, it's a case, you know, you might think, oh, man, there's only like a handful of us. But when I arrived, there was, there was zero. <laughs> May have been one. And, 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 it's, 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 and, the, it, it, and in a way, there, there, there has to be a change. There's, and, and there's several reasons for that. Uh, you know, one, there are now more vet schools or more universities doing veterinary education. And, and equally, the turnover of, of, of the profession is such that you need to con continually have, um, you know, uh, talent coming through. But equally, from a statistic that I read, uh, that uh, in London, I believe, or in the southeast in general, um, BAME students, black students, BAME, etc., represent amongst young people something ridiculous like forty-five percent. I can't remember. This it's quite a high figure. Yeah. So when you look now at students who are doing their A levels, a significant number of them are are BAME. So no university now cannot ignore that. Nor should they. I'm, I'm sure they won't. But now it's really important that um, uh, with that, you know, ca talent come in. Is it really important that um, universities show that visibility? Which is why I ended up doing that program for you know the Royal Society of Biology because they they had all the data to suggest. Oh, then more and more students are going to university. So when I went to university, it was what two percent. Now it's forty five percent. Okay. Uh, and we know there's a shortage of, of scientists. Uh, I'm, I'm a chair of governors of the school. There is a shortage of maths teachers in the UK, right? If you're a maths teacher, it is gold dust. And, and, and so part of that is that we, we don't have enough people going into sciences. And so, so it, and therefore that's why, you know, the Royal Society said, hold on, we've got to increase visibility of, of, of people from BAME background to inspire the next generation to consider sciences, uh, and 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 I think it's going to take a while. Don't get me wrong, um, and and I think it's it's not just on universities. What what's clearly got to happen is society in general um, uh, take some of that. So so for example, when it comes to being presented by the media, the media is one of, I think I read a report in The Guardian a few weeks back that says when it came to black stories, something like 70% is all negative. Yes. This is particularly for young black males. Yes. You know, so for young black males, their story is one. So if you're growing up in that environment, and, and so what you do need are um, imagery. Um, you, you need stories and things like that. So where people can say, oh, okay, Oh, so so, so that is possible. Oh, you you can do that. So that that's what what's needed, and hopefully that will inspire the next generation to say, oh, okay, this is possible. Yeah, I think We're talking it's, about. Sorry, go on, Ellie. Go go for it. It's, I think we've spoken like so much about like black students as they come into university and supporting them when they're in school, and. Like it, I think in a very similar to paper, one that you mentioned, Donald, like it was found that like black students, I think this was back in like 2016, are like one and a half times more likely to drop out of university than their white or Asian counterparts. And even though we have 27, 28 percent of students coming from BAME backgrounds, you know, BAME students are, you know, about 11 percent of them in the UK will drop out, whereas in white students, it's only about 5%. And supporting our black British university students while they're here is a really important conversation to have. And I was just wondering from your experiences, you know, yours, Olivia, being a recent undergraduate and yours, Winnie, being in educational institutions for so long, and yours, Donald, from being a student and then, you know, researcher and now a lecturer, 
how do you think from your stories we can support black British university students better now and while they're here? I think that is an excellent point. <laughs> um, like I said before, there aren't that many minorities. Obviously, it has changed. There used to be none. So, you know, we, there is a few now. So that is, you know, progress, slowly progress. Um, but there aren't that many people in my like year, in my cohort that are from like a minority background, which although is a negative thing, I think we've all realised that and we stick together to help each other because this is a challenging course. So we help each other get through this. And I think that is like comforting in itself that we, you know, realise that it is stressful and we want to help each other to get through and be vets because we're all here you know to have we're all in the same degree program we all want to have the same end goal I do think it is harder for BAME students in academia because there's just a like imposter syndrome like I constantly feel like I have to work twice as hard just to be seen as like you know doing the same amount or equal as my like counterparts so having other people from BAME I think is a really like good influence because you can rely on each other and you can relate to each other's experiences and you can comfort each other um, and I do think it is the role of institutions like across the UK to be educating their students while they're at university not just about degree programs but also about like just life skills like unconscious bias training so that when they go into professions and they're in the working world they know how to deal with like class race able-bodiedness like there are so many different intersections of life that universities need to be implementing and teaching as well as you know the degree program so I think you know just stuff like that it needs to be more of a focus in like the actual curriculum alongside what that your degree program that you're studying so I do think the universities have like a responsibility to be educating you know us for the wider population of us you know going out into society and working and being a part of like you know the next generation of like the workforce so I do yeah that's what I think but that was an excellent point I'm glad you brought that up and, and you interesting yeah. idea, actually because you know you make a very good point this, this is the kind of thing that institutions are very good at doing but more so for staff mm. than for the students exactly you know and 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 you know so staff have all sorts of trading and unconscious bias and various things but it does not often translate to exactly. anything that the students do the students come exactly. they do their studies their courses and they go away exactly. with their degrees it doesn't yeah. filter down like and especially for veterinary medicine we have like a specific example we have a strand called professional studies mm. and it's all about you know developing you to being you know a good effective communi communicator mm. and you know a good listener and we have lectures and we have activities and we have studies on how to do those things and I just think it's crazy that we're not also taught among, like under that umbrella on how to be dealing with people you know from different classes from different backgrounds you know how to just have like common manners like what words you can and can't use like these things I didn't realize that we still have to be telling people but like I think it is it just should be taught as part of the degree program well I, maybe we're, we're taking a step back I, I mean I, I think now there's been a lot of research into this area um uh, and one of the leading campaigners and there have been publications um by um Baroness uh Amos mm. who, who was director of um SOAS uh, and a lot of this information on the website and so the, the, the terminology um, what it, it was called the attainment gap but that's now been rephrased to be referred to as the awarding gap and you can see at different universities that gap differs and a lot of the research and, and people are looking at this and and there's a um, several reasons for this uh, Olivia's hit on it in terms of um imposters it, it's, it's you know it's referred to almost as a, a sense of belonging mm. uh, uh, and, and equally um you know uh how institutions engage and interact um uh you know uh, you know at, at a general level you know like when he spoke about a lecturer coming up to say look have you considered a phd um because that's something she wasn't thinking of and it's, it's quite clear still uh, for many black or BAME students, they're the first one in their generation to go to university. Yeah. So it's, it's it's knowing that landscape, you know, it's, it's referred to as social capital. Um, and how you navigate that is really important. And so it, it's, you know, so so um, when, when you consider, you know, students, uh, you know, you know, if you consider middle class and upper class students, 
um, at least one of their parents or both have gone to university. So there's subliminal activities on how to navigate that landscape. It is almost part, but whereas for, for BAME students, there is the first time. So they've not got some of that skill set that's required, um, you know, and, that, you know, it's, uh, there's evidence of microaggression and indeed we have to acknowledge it racism. So, you know, so, it, you know, so BAME students but may not actually get um, to choose a subject or, you know, be asked to or be encouraged to do that. So what there is, one, there's no silver bullet, but what there are is a, a, a multitude of, of factors. Um, and it's really difficult to in, 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 entangle them. But there are some universities who have recognized this and are actually trying to do various things to, to address that. One university that I, I can think of, and, I, and I've been to a meeting where they've been looking at this, is Kingston University. Mm. Um, they have a large number of BAME students. Mm. And so they have recognized this attainment gap. And more importantly, is they've said, it's not the BAME students problem. Mm. Mm. And, and that's why they've, they've changed the terminology. Attainment relates to, you know, level of acad academia, et cetera, et cetera. And that might mean that BAME students aren't intelligent. What they've now changed it is to awarding gap because we are awarding students um, their degree. So they're looking into aspects of social economic background, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, contextual added and to try and both one support, look at how their institution and also the whole area of decolonizing the curriculum. Mm. So, they, you know, and so so universities are, are, are doing things like that in, you know, so because they've recognized um, that there is this awarding gap, which I must say differ between different universities. Mm. <laughs> um, so the RBC is definitely, you know, they are trying. They have the widening participation team have like the Sutton Trust School. They've got the yeah. Gateway Program. Like they are, they have recognised it. And I do think this is the beginning of them making long lasting change. And I'm glad that universities are finally realising that this is something that they need to be doing actively. Like again, like you said, yeah. it's not the student's fault. So I'm glad that finally the conversation yeah. is turning into actually being something positive and something that's actually, you know, they're, they're taking actions that are actually going to make long lasting change and effect and, you know, change the demographic. So that I definitely think that's a great idea. I think there's, I think we've recently got awarded like a £20,000 research grant. The RVC did, I think it was, yeah, Dr. Victoria Crossley, um, and the co-founder of the British Veterinary Ethnicity and Diversity Society, they both got recently given like a research grant to specifically like investigate experiences of racism and racism and its impacts on the mental well-being of BAME students. And I'm just really happy to see where we go from here. You know, if we had this conversation a year from now, you know, what would be different? And it's positive. And sometimes it doesn't feel positive because we need to have really difficult conversations. Um, but that's why it's so nice to have a forum like this because they're positive conversations at the end of the day because we're making good things happen by through them. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree, Ellie. And and that grant that you just mentioned actually is is I think it's a really big strong step in 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 the right direction. And um, actually, I happen to be involved in it, so I know a little bit about it. And and the whole idea is is really to get that bit more understanding of what the issues are. And it is, I suppose, quite specific to the veteran profession, but like a lot of these things, it is transferable to the, to the wider sciences. And I think there are a lot of issues that we need to understand. And, and to go back to Donald's point, you know, in, in terms of really actively supporting BAME students and, and, and BAME staff as well in, in, yeah. in our institutions of higher education, you know, we, we need to have a good sense and a good understanding of, of people's experiences. And I think there needs to be very, it, it, it's not enough that we get the BAME students in mm. into institutions. We need to do much more than that in supporting them and in keeping them there and in, in, in getting them to succeed. Yes, exactly. You know, and, and that is, it's, it's well enough that we get them in, which, which we are doing with a widening participation, but what do we do after beyond getting them into our institutions? And I, I think certainly the RVC is, is working towards that. And this, this, this project that we're talking about is one, is, is one small step in doing so and getting a better understanding of what the issues are. But I do think there needs to be really strong 
deliberate action in supporting um, BAME students with all of their, with their, with their you know, because they, they're coming to, to university with very different backgrounds to what would traditionally be in a vet school, you know. Yeah, and 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 as I mentioned, it, it's it's in, in terms of, and I think Christine, you're right, and and I may have mentioned this before, but one of the key things is that 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 potential social capital, Absolutely. which they don't have that that yeah. skill set, because equally, we know and, and we also know even when BAME students graduate, um, there's a disparity in terms of both pay gap. And also the kind of jobs they go go for or go into, um, so so there there, there is that um, you know difference that that occurs, uh, and so as you say, it's society in, in general um, that that has to develop approaches and strategies. Well, Donald, you now raise another point, which I suspect might actually be another different conversation altogether, <laughs> <laughs> or continuation of this, because. We've talked about students, but then they graduate, hopefully they succeed, and then where do they go and how do they get supported in their careers in science? Yeah. You know, and, and at the moment, we don't have strong evidence to suggest that there is the same level of success and achievement and, and movement up to senior positions in, in institutions. Once, you know, black people finally get their, their, their degree awards, so again, there's, there's a whole area of work there in terms of that career progression and, and seniority when it comes to careers. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, you're right. And, and I think part of it, you know, it is, you know, um, in terms of us having this conversation and what, what organisations are, are, are doing um, is that they are looking at, at themselves and addressing where there are a lack of inclusion and, in, and equality. Uh, I, I mean, this is seen, um, and I think it's a combination, of, you know, of the, the the tragic death of George Floyd, COVID, and lockdown. That's almost created this perfect storm, uh, and people are looking at it. Um, and all organisations are now starting to re-examine themselves. Yeah. Um, and, and and a main one in relationship to to COVID is is the NHS, um, uh, and there have been various reports. You know that that um, that have looked at the so-called you know snowy white peaks. So you'll see the NHS is is one of the largest employers of 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 BAME individuals, and you see them represented at various levels, except for the very except top. The top. Yeah. <laughs> and and people are if you if you just did the the natural progression, the if you just just did natural progression, you know. They would be be up there, um, and and what they're now having is that conversation. Um, so so why isn't there that natural progression? Exactly. And 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 that's also seen. I know within the civil service. Yeah. Again, in the civil service, you find that um, uh, at, at other levels, there's fifty fifty. There's whatever it is. But then when it comes to the senior level, it's not. And again, just by the process of if we're taking sticking to science by osmosis and diffusion, <laughs> you they they would be there. They should be. Yes, so, so the question then, the, 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 the uncomfortable conversation may be, so why isn't that happening? And and then ask the question, what can we do about it? Yeah. Which, which um is a conversation that, that's needed. Mm. Primarily because and I, I say this because there's two things. Young people are demanding change yes. from all backgrounds. <laughs> but equally is the case where, you see, those institutions may have remained those ways for a number of years. And the problem is the demographic of young people coming out of university now was very different than when I graduated. So organisations have, have, have got to change because the, the, the student bodies that are, are coming out are going to be different. Exactly. We, we've talked about a lot of things. If we were now to think about, okay, if, if you had to say one thing to a young black person who is considering, you know, a career in the sciences or actually before even a career, 
just considering getting into the sciences in higher education, given all your experiences, what would you say to them? Or maybe what would you say to your younger self might even be something that <laughs> might be another way to look at it. I think Olivia mentioned something earlier about um, whenever she was interested in um, applying for veterinary sciences and doing that research and finding out what she needed and all that stuff, because I didn't have that. Yeah. Um, because again, I, it was purely coincidental for me. So if I could go back in time, I think I would actually try and be more active in that sense um, and find out more resources, find different subjects even, um, find different potential career paths and then actually have a plan <laughs> as to yeah. where I would like to end up. And I think that's what I would say to a young black person as well, is don't limit yourself, even within science. Don't just go for pure biology or, or pure chemistry or biomed. Um, if you want to do physics, give that a go. Like broaden um, what it means for you, what science is, because there's so many different career paths and so many different um, career progressions where, you know, you could be an astronaut if you wanted to be. And, you know, there are there's just so many different opportunities and the opportunities are there. You just have to um, be more, I guess, proactive in that sense of either finding the right subjects, the right work experiences that you might need, making the right contacts. I mean, right now, with the way social media is and the internet is, you can, you can find um, on Twitter, you can you can message people to do internships. There's so many different things that you can do now that I wish I had realised or been more proactive back then. I think that's yeah, that's exactly. The only limitations is the limitation on yourself. Like you can do anything. You mm -hmm. just you've got to make a list and you just got to tick these things off the mm -hmm. list. Force your way through it because yeah. no one can stop you from doing stuff. Like the yeah. only person that's going to stop you is what the cap you put on yourself is. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely think that's a good thing. Going back to role models, I think the importance of having like visibility is showcasing to the younger generation, like, look, like we've done it, we've made it this far, like you can do it too. So that inspiring, you know, like Winnie with your PhD program, Donald just being like a professor, like Christine, all the work you're doing, like with the institution, Ellie just being like on there. So you just like the fact that there are proactive people in now like positions of power or positions of privilege mm -hmm. where they can implement and enforce change is really, mm -hmm. I think it's just inspiring. So I do have hope for the future because there's definitely... I think there's more of a hunger for change I, I, I've never really like witnessed before people are really like I want better and I'm, we're going to get better so let's like make some change now so I definitely feel hopeful for the future. Fantastic. Yeah I, I just just building on what you said I think hunger for change it, it's so important I what would I tell a young black person who wants to enter higher education and get into the sciences I just say you deserve to be here you fully deserve to be here not just to be here but to thrive and be accepted and be celebrated and changes are being made and people in positions of power want what's best for you and it isn't your responsibility to advocate for yourself because mm -hmm. institutions and students unions and organizations are recognizing that we need to be there to support you and so yeah you deserve to be here and please come you know we want you we really mm -hmm. really want you you see, Ellie's is doing a pitch there. I want to. <laughs> <laughs> you said it yeah, was advertising. So. Yeah, I, I, no, I, I, I agree. We, we agree. I, I mean, I, I think the, the key, you know, what would you say to a, a young black person? Um, and and I, it is really, it, and it, you know, when Winnie says, I, I don't know if I'm a role model or, you know, and it, it there's, there's a, a phrase, you know, and, and people have come up to me uh, privately, particularly students, and have commented, and it's really our presence liberate others. It's literally just our presence. We don't have to do anything, but it, it's literally our, 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 our presence liberate others. And um, that, that visibility is powerful. Uh, and I think we are all role models um, in a sense. Uh, and what I would say to to a, a young person, um, you know, is to, um, you know, is to is yeah to you don't and 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 the limitations I, I recognize because it, it's something which is not is more more than likely 
uh, from outside influences. Um, and because one of the, one of the, the, the issues, and I work for a, a, a couple of organizations, one organization which I have to give props to, um, there's a couple. So I've done some work with Urban Synergy, who are brilliant. And then I've done work with another organization, Amos Bursary. And Amos Bursary is a brilliant organization um, uh, um, run by um, Colleen Amos OBE. She recently got her OBE. Uh, and, and it's a mentoring organization. And it's particularly looking at black boys. Uh, you may or may not know, but they're the highest rate of exclusions, yeah. black boys. And what she's doing is taking some really bright young black boys and developing them, and 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 they're now going to top unis. One of them will be, I, I think, a, a future leader. Uh, and, and part of that is to inspire, encourage, motivate, and inspire them. Um, and the, the, you know, and and the pressures there are under. And this is what I would say to a young person: it is really a case of some of those that I've mentored and, and supported is that is that with that with the you know mixture of peers peer pressure. Uh, in that in 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 aspect of negativity is to really try more to be yourself so in a sense a young man that i help support to go to durham you know his friends were just giving teasing him about being a geek and it's yeah. it's different you know because and and black black boys and I, I, I as a black man i i recognize those um you know external pressures because and I still don't know, but what is the definition of being black? I still query that. So 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 young boys feel they have to act a certain way, walk a certain way, and if they don't fit in, they're going to be seen as odd. And it's really to say to them, uh, and I've, I've mentioned the numbers to say, look, if you do like science or if you do like English, if you do like reading, and that's something, yeah, yeah, please, and then try and find appropriate role models so they can say, oh, so there is someone like that who, who, who I can be. Uh, and the other organization I, I should give props to is, is Reach Society. So it's, it's a charity that I've helped co-found and we have a number of role models and we visit schools, colleges um, and try and in inspire young people. Um, because when you scratch below the surface, there are a lot of talented people out there. Mm -hmm. It's just that they don't get a spotlight. And, and I think that's where, if we can change that narrative, um, then, you know, as what, you know, what you're doing with Animal Aspirations, Winnie, uh, uh, you know, what you're doing to encourage more people to do PhDs, that would be great. So that's what I would say to young people, that there are opportunities. Wow. Look, you're all inspiring. This is one conversation we can have 10 other conversations from all the things that we've said here and, and I actually look I think this is the, the beginning of the many conversations that I hope we're going to have around around this, this area and around all the, all of these issues because the talking and the conversations and the openness it's it's an important part of, of all of this you yeah. know it, it really is so I shall look forward to the next one oh, um, thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah. All the best to everybody. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.